On behalf of the BNG Board of Trustees, um, I would also like to welcome uh, Dr. Jennifer Atrid Sterling, uh, the Permanent Secretary of the Ministry of Youth, Culture and Sport, uh, Dr. Kim Desmond Robinson, the Director of the Department of Culture, and then also Jennifer Phillips, the Chair of the Bermuda Arts Council. Uh, thank you all for your generous support for this exhibition and related programming, and also to the Centennial Bermuda Foundation for their additional support for JDA's exhibition. I would also like to welcome those who are following our live feed, uh, and I would note that this, evening, this, excuse me, this evening's talk will be made available online through our social media channels and also on bng.bm. Over the past year, we've had the distinct pleasure of getting to know Jerde, and through this process, getting to see what a dynamic, considered, and prolific artist she is. I would like to thank her for working with us on our first solo exhibition here at the Bermuda National Gallery, um, and for her effort, engagement, and also for her courageousness in the exhibition that she has uh, created um, over the course of the past year. Uh, it's a truly important exhibition for our community, um, and it's, uh, it's fantastic. So for those of you who have yet to come in, um, I would really highly encourage you uh, to come and see it. Before Jared a tells us a bit more about how all of this came to be, um, I do have a, a brief selection or a section of her biography um, that I would like to read. Jared a. Hassel is a contemporary artist whose work is developed through a process of autoethnography doing up here, connecting her own experience and academic research to larger cultural, historical, and political meanings and understandings. She graduated from the University of North Carolina at Greensboro in 2013, exploring ideas about representation, perception, identity creation, and childhood. Her vibrant collages capture and collect the gaze. Her artwork is on permanent display in the Bermuda Government Administration Building. She has cons uh, consecutively showcased and auctioned her work in Tina Lawson's annual wearable art gala, that's Beyonce's mother. Uh, she has presented her work in solo and group exhibitions in Bermuda, the United States, and China. And she is the host of the Artifacts podcast, which celebrates and amplifies the voices and, of artists of the African diaspora. Jude is currently an MFA candidate at the China Academy of Art. That's Jude. Um, we will learn more. Uh, in this moment, I would also like to introduce Dr. Kim Dismar Robinson, Director of the Department of Culture, uh, to say a few words about today. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks again very much for joining us. Um, on behalf of the Department of Culture, I am very happy that the BNG uh, had approached us and had these discussions about sponsoring this exhibition. Um, I think on both a personal and professional level, it was, it's very gratifying to me for, um, for me to be able to say that the department I work for helped to sponsor this particular exhibition. Um, I say that uh, as a Bermudian who recognizes that this work is not just Jerday's family story, but it is also a collective story and it is part of a very important thread of our culture, of our history, um, and I think that it it helps us to look at this in a different way, and that's part of the role of art. So very grateful to both the Bermuda National Gallery, uh, to the Bermuda Arts Council, as well as Jerde Hassel. And without further ado, I would like to introduce her so that she can tell us more about her work. Thank you, Jerde. Good evening, everybody. Thank you so, so much for being here. It's a pleasure to be back home in Bermuda. Um, I think when thinking about um, showcasing my work, the only place that I could think about for my first solo exhibition was to be here in Bermuda. Um, and what's special about being here in this space is that the BNG has been in my dream book for a really long time. <laughs> um, since I made the decision to actually become an artist, um, BNG has been in there. Um, almost as like this thing that I kind of wanted to reach and get to. Um, and so to be able to be here in this space at 30 years old is, it's wow. I mean, I imagine like being here in this space at maybe 50 or 60. So this is a lifelong dream for me that came um, much earlier than I expected. And I'm just so humbled and grateful. And so thank you guys for being here in this space and everyone who is watching on Instagram Live because you guys are very much so a part of my dream. Like this is surreal for me. So thank you so, so much for being here. I welcome everyone today. 
So before I begin and tell you a little bit about my journey, I want to first thank Bermuda National Gallery for this wonderful opportunity. Um, this has been in the works for about uh, maybe a year and a half uh, to two years. Uh, we first encountered one another when I had my uh, group show at BSOA. Um, it was an emerging artist group show in 2019. And um, from there, we developed a relationship. And so this has kind of been in the works for a really long time. But I didn't really know what I was going to present at the time. Um, and we, we kind of developed uh, over the course of the year. So thank you, Bermuda National Gallery, for your consideration. Eve, Peter, it's been amazing developing a relationship with you. I'd also like to thank the Department of Culture for sponsoring this event. It's a dream. And also Jennifer Phillips with Bermuda Arts Council. Thank you so much for your generosity and um, the grant. This absolutely wouldn't have been possible um, without the support of both um, organizations, the Centennial Bermuda Foundation as well, and Lisa Howie um, of Black Pony Gallery. Thank you so, so much. Um, I'd also like to thank my mom and my sisters and all of the volunteers who helped install the exhibition. Um, it was definitely a group effort. I couldn't have, I mean, you guys have seen. <laughs> I couldn't have installed all of that by myself, and so it's totally been a, a collective effort. So thank you so, so much to everyone. Um, who has been a part of this moment and making this possible. Okay, so I wanna talk a little bit about uh, my, my journey. I think in order to understand my work and where I am right now in my life as an artist, I think it's important to kind of understand my journey and how I started. So I've kind of always been like this little art nerd. <laughs> When I was younger, I used to spend much of my time by myself in solitude just making work. Um, I used to make these like little paper people. And interestingly, I feel like the works that I'm making now as an adult are very much so related with um, my experiences um, when I was a child. And so um, here's myself with Manuel Palacio. Um, here's a workshop um, that I did. And so I've, I've always kind of like been engaged in the arts, but I think when I was a young person, I didn't really see a future in being an artist. I didn't really have like a real example of anyone who was doing it and was like extremely successful. And so when the time came for me to decide what I was gonna do for university, um, unfortunately, I didn't choose art. I think being in Bermuda um, is very much so like a part of that as well. You know, because we think about like young people thinking about um, their experiences in school and like what the trajectory would be. You know, most of us are encouraged to take up medicine or law or reinsurance here on island. And so the arts were, were just kind of something that I viewed at that time as a hobby. And um, in high school, I, I would say that I really was able to develop um, my love for art. Unfortunately, I didn't choose it. Ms. Wallman was disappointed, <laughs> um, but um, you know, I'm, I'm happy to say that I did find my way back um, to my first true love. This is my absolute passion and dream. And so I did study at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. I actually was a candy striper um, at the hospital, and so that's what I decided to study. Um, in undergrad, so I did that for four years, and at that time, which was interesting, it was crazy, I never drew, painted, I never did anything for about five years, it kind of took like a hiatus. So um, one of my friends, uh, Kathleen, she's my best friend, she purchased some art supplies for me, because I, I told her, like, I love art, and she was like, what do you mean, like, I've never seen you make anything, like, so one Valentine's Day, uh, she bought me a, a bunch of art supplies and was just like, you said you love it, so here you go. So that's kind of like how I got back into it. And that was my senior year of um, university. And after that, it just kind of uh, unfolded on its own. At that time, I did return to Bermuda and I was looking, actively looking for a job um, within public health because that was what I studied. And unfortunately, I wasn't able to secure a job after coming back from university. In hindsight, I feel like it was one of the best things that happened for me, um, just because it allowed me to uh, feel very uncomfortable and also to be able to reflect 
on what it is that I actually wanted to do as opposed to what I was trying to do in order to just earn a quick buck here. Um, the Art Walk was the first place that I ever showcased my artwork here on the island. Um, I think Amy Zanders was the organizer for this. Um, and I think this was in 2015. I was super nervous and I, you know, I felt like I was putting my heart and my soul out for everybody to see. And um, that experience for me in you know, being public with the work, I think was something that I really needed. At that time, I was still thinking that I wasn't going to pursue art. I was still thinking that it was just gonna be a hobby and just something that I would do on the side. Um, and so I went to law school. <laughs> which is interesting. Um, and <laughs> yeah, I went to law school and was going to be doing a transfer um, a program because I didn't have a undergraduate degree like in law, so I would have had to do a transfer program at BPP University. Needless to say, I only spent about three months there before I was like, this is absolutely not for me. I mean, I was in class drawing the whole time, trying to figure out how I was going to get money to buy art supplies. And um, it, I just remember one morning I had walked into the building, um, and this was in Manchester, um, UK. I walked into the building and I had to decide what I was gonna do with my life. I felt overwhelmingly um, kind of anxious about just being in class and knowing that I wasn't living my truth. And so I had to decide if I was gonna go to class or if I was gonna go to the counselor's office and withdraw from school. And so um, I went left and went to the consul's office and withdrew, and the rest is history. I decided that I would work for a year and save up money and um, save up money so that I could make a transition and go to China. Um, one of the questions that have been asked so much over the past couple of days has been, why China? Um, I, I felt at that time that I needed to be somewhere where I could have access to inexpensive art supplies, I could travel Southeast Asia and get inspired by my work. But initially I had my eyes set on Korea and that in some way, shape or form didn't pan out. And so um, I just remember interviewing for a few different positions. And so uh, one was in Beijing, one in Tokyo, and then the other um, was in Guiyang, which is where I ended up in Southeast China. And I interviewed with them and they said to me, okay, well, we love you. Like, can you come today? <laughs> Essentially. <laughs> so I was literally in China the next week. Um, I didn't think about it. I didn't um, have any second thoughts about it. I was ready to just make a transition. And at that time, that was the time that I had decided that I was going to pursue my art career. Um, I would set up a studio space. I would teach English and then use my money from my schooling to, well, from my job to um, pay for my studio space. Um, and so that's how China happened. Um, and this was, this image was actually in a museum in Manchester. And this was a pivotal moment for me because this was around the time when I had made the decision um, to pursue my dream. And so uh, in 2016, here I am in Guiyang, China. Uh, which was crazy because after um, my bags were lost, after I didn't have any clothes in China for two weeks, <laughs> I decided um, that I was gonna stay. And I told myself that if I can make it through the first two weeks, then you know I can make it a month. And then I said, okay, if I can make it past a month, then I can stay three months. And then six months, and then a year came. And so initially, um, I was uh, teaching English and um, at the time, it was amazing because at, I was trying to figure out how to uh, find my footing, uh, how to connect with people and network. And it took me about six months to find any art supplies. So just imagine like six months of, oh, you know, I'm pursuing my dream of being an artist and not having anything, no studio, no art supplies. Um, the, the language barrier was crazy, um, but then, by some you know, stroke of faith, I was able to meet this gentleman who was introduced to me by one of my students' fathers. Um, he is Joe Lu, and he has been amazing. He has become my mentor, 
and he is also the reason why I am at the China Academy of Art. He was the one who wrote my letter of recommendation. And so he would come and pick me up every Monday morning and take me to his studio, which was you know, a drive out um, outside of the city near the mountains. And it was a studio space that he shared with a few other artists. And so he would come and pick me up and he would allow me to spend the whole day just in there painting. Um, he also invited me to come and um, sit in on his life drawing classes, which were fantastic, but also taught in Chinese. So <laughs> that was a bit challenging, but you know, art is very much a visual, so I was able to um, catch along and uh, follow along and you know, do what I needed to do. So he was extremely generous and became uh, one of those people that have essentially changed the trajectory of uh, my life. And so this was uh, one of the spaces uh, in the studio space that he shared with some of the people. Um, I also spent a lot of time on the roof of my apartment in Guayang. As you can see behind, there's like a little mountain. I would put all of my art supplies in a, in a little um, suitcase and take it in the elevator and go up and just paint. And I began just painting as much as I could. I was teaching English, and at the time, my, my job was very demanding. And so I would only be able to paint on maybe Mondays and Tuesdays when I had time off. Um, but I spent a lot of time in solitude, in nature, um, walking these mountains, um, which were accessible to the residents in the area, and just trying to find um, some inspiration. There was also like this garden um, in the back behind the apartment building, which was really beautiful, and I would just take all of my stuff out there and just paint and listen to music. It was amazing. Um, the other thing that was pivotal in my trajectory as well was meeting this gentleman who actually owned this art supply store. Um, you can see at the top there are like this, these giant calligraphy brushes. Um, I was fascinated by them. I found him like in the back of this market, I had no idea it was there. And one day I had just been in there, um, just randomly, and I came across this and it changed everything for me. I was able to get everything I needed from him. He had all kinds of um, canvas, um, paints, everything that, I mean, you can imagine in there. And as you can see here, there's like a tea table. And so he would invite like people that he really liked to come and have tea with them. And with Chinese people, if they like you and they invite you to have tea, it's you know like a sign of respect. So um, I was able to develop like a really great relationship um, with him as well. Um, so I, I taught a lot, spent much of my time in the classroom. This was actually an experience uh, where I was inv an invited guest at the children's hospital. Um, all of these children were sick, and I just came and spent some time like playing with them. Um, I found that the kids and their spirit like really inspired me um, and you know just helped me to think about how I used to feel as a kid and how interconnected that was with my arts practice. Um, so this is us in a village. Um, this village was actually really interesting because they were building some kind of um, highway because you had to like go on back roads to access it. You couldn't just access it from regular roads. So um, the Chinese government had put a lot of money into a, a, a highway that would connect this village uh, with the rest of Guiyang. And so they invited me to come and sing with them. Um, it was it was amazing, absolutely incredible. Um, and this is like a sign of respect um, in China as well, the, one of the little boys was just greeting me. Um, so I also spent time uh, teaching young people, but also we had some adults that would come in and we would do like um, art and SIP classes, which were really fun. Um, this school was actually about five minutes away from my apartment. So the first year that I was in China, um, I was teaching English, but the second year, it was an amazing opportunity happened. Um, I had met a lady, and uh, you know, I was telling her that I was an artist, and she was like, "Well, you know, I'm developing an arts program at my my school. Why don't you come? Like, you know, we don't have the program yet." So they were what they were wanting to do is like sports 
or English through sports or English through art, like for, uh, for kids. And so she didn't have the program established and so she invited me to come and kind of create like a curriculum for the kids there. So that was an amazing opportunity. I lived about five minutes away from the school. So I was able to like walk to work. Um, there were times I uh, joined uh, these groups where people were able to come in and uh, look at the Taoist um, texts and then also um, work with uh, calligraphy and inks, which were absolutely incredible. Um, calligraphy and the, the language of, of China is so much embedded in the culture and the characters are like visual, very visual. Um, so Chinese understand in terms of images. And so I found myself really drawn to um, learning how to write some of the characters in calligraphy. And it's much harder <laughs> than it looks. It's, it's very much so like about meditation and uh, qi and uh, flow of energy. And I, I thoroughly um, enjoyed those classes. Um, this is me also teaching at uh, a company had invited me to come and, and teach and do like a paint and sit with them. Here is my mentor again. Um, he would sometimes come and pick me up and be like, you know, we're going to go out and paint plein air today, so why don't you come along? And so this village is actually really beautiful and many people drive out to go and see this village and set up easels like all along like this hill and just look over um, behind some of the um, buildings, which is is absolutely incredible um, place to paint. And so at that time, I was thinking about, okay, you know, I'm teaching at this school, which is great, I'm teaching art, but I wanted to be engaged more so with my own artistic practice. And so at that time, I decided that I wanted to go back to school. Um, because I didn't study art in undergrad, I felt like I needed to kind of marry my talent with some skill. And so I decided that I would go to SCAD, and this institution was actually um, in Hong Kong, um, Savannah College of Art and Design. It's a sister school with the one in Georgia, um, in Savannah, um, in Georgia. And I visited there and I was so sold on this school until my professor had told me about the China Academy of Art and um, that's when he decided to write the letter of recommendation for me. And I applied to the contemporary art program there. Um, at this time, I was also developing my own work, uh, which was really interesting because I never envisioned anybody would ever see these. Like these were kind of created as um, like outlets, like for therapy, because <laughs> I had a fabulous time in China, but it was also extremely challenging. Um, you know, I think just being a black woman in China um, that was like one of the hardest things that I've ever had to experience and go through. I mean, people would come up and like want to take photos of me and follow me and try to touch me. Like I remember one time I was swarmed by people in a um, supermarket and it was really scary because at the time I didn't really understand that much Chinese so I didn't really know what was happening around me. And so um, I just remember like being in my apartment for three days and not wanting to come out. It was just crazy. And so I started doing these alibis, is what I call them, because I kind of like view them as like friends, but also like um, self-portraits in a way. I was thinking about the gays just because I remember at the time there were just so many eyes around me all the time, looking, um, wanting to touch. Um, and so I was thinking about who captures the gaze. And the, the layering for the eyes kind of became like, a way to distance myself from the, the people that I was encountering like every single day. And so um, I was doing these, like at the time I was actively pursuing my portfolio trying to get proficient with oil painting. And so these for me kind of felt very crafty and not really like fine art. Um, and so I never envisioned that they would kind of like take on a life of their own and just like explode. One day I had posted one on social media and ever since then it's just been overwhelming um, the amount of love that I've received um, from these. And these were actually very much so connected with the um, installation that I did here at the Bermuda Biennial last year. A turning point with these was this particular image. 
Um, this is when I had posted this on social media and Tina Knowles Lawson's team had contacted me and invited me to come and showcase the work um, with the Wearable Art Gala. And um, this work sold uh, for a pretty penny and it just kind of like took off from there. It's been incredible. And um, last year was my second year showcasing with them. This was, this was last year. And you can see my work is the, the circular one on the Chinese calligraphy uh, board behind Tina Lawson. Um, so this is me in my studio space. So this is my apartment. So I had a two bedroom apartment um, and I transformed the entire like living area space into my studio space. And that was also the work that I was working on for the Emerging Artist Showcase um, at BSOA. And also the work that I used for my portfolio for my um, master's program as well. So I was in here all day, all night. <laughs> Um, here is the, the work from 2019, Glitter in Their Veins. Um, they're really um, large scale, um, kind of life size works. Um, this is actually a family portrait. Um, these are my sisters, my mom, and my dog, Chubby. <laughs> um, and this, this work um, was also here at uh, BSOA as well. And these are my uh, best friends, Shanti and Kayla. This was also in the show. Um, these works were a fan favorite. I love them. Um, they're, they're actually like old Bermuda window panes. My dad had some laying around because um, he's a contractor and just had some like laying around. And I was like, wow, it could be really interesting if I were to do something with those. You know, I'm thinking about the gaze. I'm thinking about um, who is looking. And so I thought it was really interesting to place the figures like inside of the window um, being Bermuda. Um, traditional window panes. Um, so this was at the exhibition before the work was installed. And uh, shortly after the exhibition, so that, that summer of 2019, I was also preparing to move back to China because I had left for the summer and spent my summer here in Bermuda and um, was transitioning back to China, but a new city, Hangzhou, which is where I'm at now at the China Academy of Art. And um, these are the buildings that are on campus. So the red building on the right, that's like right across from um, our studio spaces. It's an amazing building. Um, I can't remember the architect who made this, but it's phenomenal like in person. Um, here, here's me on campus uh, painting and um, on the right waiting for class to start. Um, the campus is absolutely beautiful, oh my goodness. It's like so picturesque. Um, I think that was one of the things that had really sold me because when I had gone to SCAD, it's like right in the city. Whereas this campus, it's so beautiful. It has like nature around it and it's you know amazing and inspiring to be on a campus like this and make work. Um, this is the studio space that they provided us with. So we all had like a a small little corner. Um, maybe I'm a little biased. I thought I had a great space because um, I had like really high ceilings, which worked out for me um, in the making of the pieces for the biennial um, that you can see here. So at the top, there here are the two, well, the three here um, that then became like fuller figures. Um, that's just the top half. So this was my little space. I was always in here. Um, here's uh, some work that I made in China. Uh, we were required to do like Chinese calligraphy classes, um, which I found to be really interesting and um, rewarding to try to learn how to paint these characters. Um, here's us at, there was like an international parade that they would have like for international students. Here's us, and we just had to like walk around. Um, they were really uh, welcoming uh, for us being there. Um, and one of the things that was fantastic was I was able to ex exhibit my work at an exhibition called To Say Almost the Same. Um, this was actually on my school's Instagram page, which I thought was really cool. I made the page. Um, and it was an interactive piece, which was very much so connected with uh, this work 
that I'm working on here at the gallery. Um, I was thinking about like my family tree at this time. And so this work, I was thinking about the interconnectivity between people. And um, I have like yarn on the side so that people can connect uh, different points on the, the painting, make connections. Um, so the biennial came and that was the, I think I was preparing at that point in December and January of, so December of 2019 and January 2020. These works were, this is how they looked in my studio space. And I think, I mean, I, maybe, I, would think, I think I'll tell you this story because to get the works here to Bermuda, oh my goodness, it was crazy trying to, to figure that out because COVID had come. Like we were there in China and um, everything had you know, started to break out of Wuhan. So we were trying to figure out um, you know, what was the next step. Um, at the time I was speaking with uh, Peter and Sophie, um, trying to figure out what I was gonna do because you know, the works were so large scale and I was in China. And so at that point, um, I remember they had locked down the dorm and we couldn't leave. They would like bring us food. We couldn't, we couldn't go out into the city or anything and get food. So the only way that we were able to leave was to have like some kind of permission saying that we were able to go to the airport. No one was able to go anywhere. It was, it was crazy. So I remember I had booked my ticket to come um, to the biennial, well back to Bermuda, and I was leaving the next morning. And so I had to write to my professor to get permission to even go to the studio space to get this work because it was there. And I was like, I am not leaving China without this work. <laughs> so, um, on, so I was leaving the next morning at like eight o'clock in the morning. And I, I received the confirmation, I think like eight o'clock that night that I could go to the studio space. So it was dark, no one was around, which is also really scary because in China, there are people around all the time. So I like hopped on someone's bike <laughs> someone's motorbike and you know was trying to get to the studio space and I just remember walking in and just being like how am I gonna get this to Bermuda and so I walk in and I was like okay well I gotta I, do, I gotta dissect it I gotta cut the work up so I literally had to cut limbs legs and that would pain me because you know I had spent all semester like, working on this work um, but I was able to, you know, finally get it all packed up. I had it in a trash bag. I was trying to, I didn't have like a portfolio bag. So I get to the dorm and there was like uh, some kind of like comforter bag on the side next to the trash. And I'm like, yes, I can put it in this. So I, I, I carried it in a comforter bag uh, here to Bermuda, which was crazy. Um, yeah, it was an amazing um, experience to get the work here. And then being back here in Bermuda to reassemble the work. Um, and so here, here is the work at the Biennial. And so um, I just painted the, the lines around them. And this work is called Interactions Bermuda. And, um, you know, I felt like at that time with everything happening uh, with COVID um, and, you know, the ways in which we had to like social distance, like thinking about the ways in which we interact with one another became really important for me um, at that time, specifically with this work. So this is the install. And so that kind of like led me here um, to this exhibition, um, which is an absolute dream. So in the summer of 2019, I, like I said, I came back home and spent the summer here. And I had come across at that time a family tree so the family tree was done by my, um, my uncle, and it connects eight generations. Um, he, it, well, it took him eight years to connect eight generations back to an Igbo tribe in Africa. So the gentleman's name was Papa Short, and um, he came from the Igbo tribe. He lived to be 103 years old. And so the family tree shows by way how we have come um, from there and then through St. Kitts um, to Bermuda. And so when I visited my aunt and I came across this family tree, I was just fascinated because, you know, we never hear about these kinds of things 
well I, at least I never did I had never heard about us having like a family tree that connected us all the way back um, to Africa and I know many Bermudians and other people of the diaspora don't have access to this information as well and so I was super fascinated by it and um, found this right before the semester um, me going back to China in Hangzhou so I was thinking about this work while I was in China and that summer I went to Bermuda archives and uh, came across the slave registry books I was looking for more information about my family unfortunately I wasn't able to find any um, but when I did come across the slave registry books I was fascinated because I had never seen them before um, I had never heard about them you know I'm Bermudian born and raised all of my life and had never heard about these books or seen them and so I felt like you know as a visual artist like it could be really interesting to do something with them um, I didn't know what at the time um, but I knew that I wanted to focus my thesis, which is what I'm required to do um, for my master's degree, master's degree program on um, this family lineage and making some kind of imagery that would connect that. So um, then I started, I've, I've been collecting um, old archival images for a really long time. I'm fascinated by archival images and just have like a whole collection of them in my iPad. So I started to think about archival imagery as like artifacts, like things that you know we, we have to think about or like find um, that were of the past as artifacts. So I, I thought it could be really interesting in thinking about this word um, to break the word up, art if facts, and how the word could be sort of like a metaphor for different time periods kind of all happening at the same time. Um, and so this was kind of like developing like through words and through like what I would have to write for my thesis. But at the time I didn't, I still didn't have like any visual for, for what I was gonna do uh, with that. Um, so then it was fascinating because I wasn't in Bermuda, but I was able to access the slave registers online. This is at the um, Bermuda National Trust website and they have the registers from 1821 and 1834 published for anyone to access. The other thing too is in the archives in uh, the government administration building, anyone can go in and see all of the documents that are there, um, which I thought was really interesting too because you know, anyone can come in, but no one knows about it, so no one's coming in. <laughs> so I thought it was really cool that um, they had the, the books published online um, digitally for people to access. So that was uh, kind of like how I started um, looking at the data and I was overwhelmed you know by the sheer amount of names um, that were just uh, listed and so I also started at this time to look at other um, slave trade databases um, this one in particular is slave voyages database uh, which you know kind of compiles like a whole range of data that's been input and um, given by researchers like all across the world um, also in the archives, I came across these images, which I was totally fascinated and captured by, um, the Annie Lusher portraits from the 1890s. Um, and so when accessing these, I started to feel like, you know, even though these people weren't actual slaves, they were very much so connected with the people who were just released on the slave registry books. Um, and so I, I figured it could be amazing to do something with these um, and so at that point that's when I started to paint um, so you can see um, I've used the images from the Annie Lusher portraits from the archives uh, to create these images so when I painted these I was like you know it's okay um, but then I thought to myself in looking at this history and looking at the data that I've been finding it almost kind of seemed like disconnected, right? Like that we had to sort of imagine um, what things could have been or who people could have been. So at that moment, I decided that it could be really cool to tear the faces and mix the identities together. Um, and so, you know, they sort of emerged as these. So the tearing of the faces um, was really intentional and I felt was a metaphor for the 
violence that people had encountered, the tearing apart of families, the loss of language, the loss of culture. And I decided to do that for all of them and then switch them. So I switched the identities of the women together. So like someone's nose would be then someone else's. And I felt like in a way that's kind of what happened because who we are now and who we emerged as um, is not necessarily like who we were before. But then how the piecing together, the putting all of these uh, different parts together back as a whole in a way, you know, creates a new person, a new identity. Who we are today is totally different. Um, and so this is how these emerge. So at that time, it was developing the exhibition, um, was speaking with Eve and Peter weekly <laughs> on Zoom, um, trying to figure out what the exhibition was going to look like. And at that time, it was only going to be the, the paintings. At that time, I still hadn't even thought about the installation. I started working on these in May of last year. And um, yeah, they, they just started to emerge this way. Um, the other thing that's really special about the, the images is that I decided that it could be really cool to tie myself back um, to these images. Although, you know, they're not my own family members, that I could put my DNA into the work some way, somehow. So on all of the, the paintings, there's a red fingerprint, um, and that's representative of my own DNA, my own heritage, my legacy um, in the work. There's also a red thread that runs in all of the images as well. I was thinking about like this collective history and uh, public memory and how um, there, there's a common thread with not only like who we are as you know Bermudians of the diaspora, but um, how there's a common thread with other people of the diaspora that emerge in other places in the Caribbean and also throughout the United States as well. Um, on the sides of the paintings, um, there's a, a really real intentional uh, black and white that I've used. Um, black and white is, I would say, is totally a part of my signature. Um, I've used it in my work um, constantly when I make my collage uh, alibi figures, the, the skin is black and white. Um, I use black and white a lot. I use it in the biennial. Um, and so I felt like I needed to use some kind of signature in the work. And so the black and white here, and if you look at the, the paintings, I don't know if you noticed them before, but if you look at the paintings, you'll see there is a black and white strip on all of them, you know, which look the same. Um, for me, these kind of bore like, a, double meaning. So it's about my signature, but it's also about how this history has framed where we are in this present moment right now and looking at this idea of two Bermudas. And I wanted to just put it subtly because I feel like it's kind of in the background um, on the sides. Nobody really talks about it, but it is a casted shadow. And in this frame, if you look at them, you'll see it in person. But when you look at them, there is this black and white casted shadow on the sides of, of all the paintings, which I felt was uh, really powerful and um, executed really well in, in a way that I didn't even envision that it would, it would look. Um, also in the, in the work, in the exhibition, um, are two poems that are near and dear to me. I'm working on a publication at the moment, something that I want to to publish, it's a book of poetry. And text and words are very much so a part of my practice. I write daily, um, I write in my journal, and I also write poems. And when making this work, I was thinking about how text has very much so informed our history as well. And I was thinking about like who gets to write the history. Um, there's also uh, this connection between this poem and um, also what I was thinking about in terms of creating the new registry book um, that I was making. I was thinking about um, family and lineage and ancestors, but then also how this present moment connects us um, now with where we've been and then also where we, where we will be. And thinking about how this present moment allows us space to be able to imagine a future for ourselves. 
Um, one of the things that was fascinating when making this work was how shadow has um, inspired me. Um, this was the inspiration for my um, acetates that you see, the installation for the acetates. I was looking at my wall one day. I have like a bunch of um, flowers in the window and the sun was setting and it casted this shadow of all of the, the um, flowers in the window pane. And I was just like, wow, that's amazing. Um, just how powerful shadow and light can be. And so um, that kind of became like the premise for thinking about how can I cast a shadow um, from uh, people. And so at that time I was also like looking in my iPad, which I, at this time I was still collecting all of the images, all archival images from many different sources, not just Bermuda Archives and um, was speaking with my mentor, Jeremy Morgan, um, who has helped me so much uh, when thinking about um, concepts and contextualizing my work. Um, he's the mentor um, who I've been assigned to in my master's degree program. And so we talk constantly, constantly about the work. And at the time I was thinking about painting on plexiglass but plexiglass is really expensive and really heavy. And so um, we were you know, just having a discussion about shadow and light. And he had said to me, well, you know, have you thought about uh, transparencies? Like, you know, this, um, the uh, overhead projector, like what, you know, teachers were right on when you were in school. And I was like, hmm, that's interesting. And so I got like the, the transparencies and decided to print the, some of the images on them and like kind of do some test runs. At the time when I was speaking with e Peter and Eve, um, it was gonna maybe look like this with three on one. Um, but that it just wasn't as uh, powerful, but that each, in, each person needed to have like their own space. And so that's how they kind of grew into becoming um, one whole individual on um, one acetate. And so also you can see, this was a test, you can see like the shadow um, behind it and just you know how this like totally inspired um, that for me. Um, and so thinking about uh, this work, I was thinking how also I could represent the, the collective um, sheer number of people that were in the registry book. And so individually, each person like has their own agency. Um, and I felt that to be really important. So then I decided, well, it could be really interesting if I were to pair an imagined face with a name in the slave registry book that I was also like looking at online. Um, and that's when it just kind of clicked and just like sort of took on a life of its own. Um, I, I was also thinking about this phrase as well, future was now when making this work. Um, so, you know, this is what you see as the large scale installation. When, when doing it initially, I did a few tests in my studio, but I had never seen them in the volume like this. So being here in this space was totally new for me and overwhelming to be able to see what the work kind of like grew into. Cause like in my own space, like I have like a two by four, it's not that big. <laughs> um, so yeah, this is just amazing. And I, I feel like they really fit into the space and you know, just kind of have a real presence about them each individually, but then collectively it's just like even better than I had even envisioned for them. So the slave registers, um, this is the one from 1830. Um, this is what they look like online. It's, and it's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. And there are uh, pages from, well, books from multiple uh, years. Um, one of the things that I found to be fascinating about the slave registry books is that how they were created as invoice receipts for the British government to pay um, slave owners to release their slaves to emancipate them from slavery. So the only reason why we even have these people's name is because they were viewed as property, right? Um, and so for me, in thinking about that, what that means in 
each individual person, we get a glimpse of a name, but we have no idea who they were or, you know, what they like, but that they, they were whole people. And I wanted to, in some way, shape, or form, represent that. And so in looking at this, that's when I got the idea to pair a, a face with a name. And so um, I decided that I would do the same thing that I did with the paintings with digital um, imagery that I had on my iPad from all of the archival images that I was collecting. And so these people are not real. They're not actually Bermudian. They're not actually of any nationality. Um, the, the eyes belong to someone else. The nose is someone else's. The mouth is someone else's. So if I had one particular image that had like a family, per se, of maybe four people, I would take the eyes from one person and then look at another photo and take the nose from someone else and then take the mouth from someone else. And so as a collage-based artist, this was important this was an important moment for me in my practice to be able to pull um, ideas and concepts and uh, small little uh, pieces of what I felt to be time uh, together to create a whole new identity for each person. And so if you can imagine, it took a really long time to, to do this, um, but I felt like it, it was necessary in order to kind of carve out space to imagine who some of these people could have been. And so behind the faces, you can see some text. The text coincides with the uh, registry book. Um, the information there is the given information um, that was from the registry book from the archives. And then at the bottom, um, you can see I am Samba, for instance. Um, this was also an important and very intentional decision for me in doing this. Um, I decided that you, you know these people have these given names. They have, you know, an assigned uh, color. That's the other thing I found to be really fascinating, too. And uh, looking at this history, I was looking at maybe the connectivity between how, um, in this present moment, how we experience colorism, right? How it could have its links with this kind of history. Um, people were identified as either C or B in the book, and that denoted either being colored or being black, and how that, from this particular time period, has translated it to the ways in which colorism exists within the African diaspora and within the black community today. Um, and so what I wanted to do was look at this data that was, um, that almost in a way took away people's identities of who they were and just, you know, viewed them as property and as laborers, and I wanted to give them some kind of agency and give them back some humanity. So it was at that point that I, that I decided to assign them an African name, which I found to be really important um, moment when I'm thinking about this work. Um, so there's this saying, Ubuntu, I am, who I am because of who you are, which is you know the title of the show. And so at the bottom you can see I am Ata. And I wanted to embody this uh, beingness um, of you know I am because I feel like no matter who we are, saying the words I am is like the most powerful thing that we could say as a human being. And to say that I am someone of African descent is extremely powerful and takes back that agency and takes back you know, a, a space for them, an identity for them, a tie to cultural heritage for them. And it's historical fiction, right? It's not real. This is an assigned name. It's a name that I actually borrowed. The, that's the other thing. I didn't want to just come up with like any random name. I was really intentional about using real African names um, to be able to pair them with the given information that was from the state registry book. Um, so what I decided to do was do some research and I used the Slave Voyages website and uh, this is where I've borrowed the African names from. So um, what I had mentioned earlier, there were two dates on the Bermuda National Trust website, the, the date from 1834 and the date from 1821. 
the day from 1834 was actually the date that I used to create the um, accordion slave rec recreation of the slave registry book. But this 1821 date was just kind of lingering a bit. And so I thought it could be really interesting to use that date. So I typed it into the system and all of these names came up um, from, there is a boat, the <coughs> ship, the Anna Maria, and this ship was quite interesting. I did a little bit of research on it and the, the people on this ship were all set free because the boat was intercepted off of the coast of Sierra Leone in 1821 and all of the people were freed. And when I found that out, I was just totally moved. And although it's unrelated to Bermuda, um, this is what collage is about. It's about taking information from many different places and pulling it together to create something new. And so I felt like there was a parallel between wanting to free the spirit of some of the Bermudians that are in the slave registry book and the actual freeing of these people that occurred in 1821. So that's the parallel um, that, that I've kind of used as a premise to use the African names. And so in our registry book, there are no um, dates, I'm sorry, no ages. And so that kind of allowed me a little bit of space to play around with um, the ages of some of the people. So if there was a name, for instance, this, like a man, he would be 16, but in our book, we would have no age. So it allowed me a little bit of space to decide and make a you know, creative decision to make that a child or to make that a baby or a man or a woman or a girl. <coughs> um, so they just kind of emerged as uh, themselves and also um, as a collective. And um, when thinking about the work, I, I felt like this wasn't just something that was about me. Um, I felt like it was something that was placed on my heart to do. Um, because when I did have the opportunity to have this space at BNG, I felt that I needed to do something that would be some kind of gift to our community. I wanted it to be much bigger than me, much bigger than my own practice. My, my practice is mostly about collage and you know these imagined figures. Um, but I felt like it could be really interesting to take this idea of what I do with my work in general using imagined figures, but basing it in history, basing it in our history, Bermudian heritage, there's so much history here. And I felt it really important at this moment in time to make something that was really impactful and you know that people would be moved by. I've been totally floored by, you know, the response to the work and you know, just how incredible it's been for people to be able to walk in and see themselves reflected and what weight that has and what, what that feels for people, what that feels like. Um, when making the work, I had moments where, you know, it was, it was a lot for me to, to deal with. Um, and, you know, I was able to kind of like process that privately. But I think as a community, like this is something that we need to heal from. It's a part of our history. Um, you know, it's, it's, hor it's horrible, you know, the, this history, but it, it's something that doesn't need to be ignored because I feel like there are remnants of this history being ignored within our community today. And um, I just felt like, you know, I needed to do it. If I was gonna have this space, then I needed to do something that mattered for us collectively. Um, and so here's the other uh, poem um, on the other side as well. And so there's also a guest book um, that I thought was, would be really interesting to include as part of um, the installation because I wanted to, in some ways, generate conversation for us as a community. And so I welcome and encourage everyone to leave a comment um, you know, to really maybe sit with the work and um, respond to it. One of the things that was totally surprising and overwhelming for me, you know, was seeing people walk in and, you know, be moved to tears. That was something that I didn't really anticipate um, with the work. 
but actually like seeing people um, have that kind of visceral response to it has just moved me so much. Um, and so I encourage you guys to please, if you can, you know, leave some thoughts and comments of, about the work. Um, so I, just to wrap things up, I just wanted to um, just share some images of young people with my work. Um, I think when thinking about being an artist, what it means for young little girls to be able to imagine themselves, to see themselves, um, to feel like some kind of path within a creative field is possible. Uh, that's extremely important for me. Um, I think that was part of the reason why I didn't choose to be an artist right out of high, high school. You know, I, I think when you can see somebody like actually doing it, it makes it real for you. Um, and so that's one of the one of the reasons why I'm doing this, I love it. I, I love connecting with young people. And, you know, it's really changed my, my whole life and just makes me feel that what I'm doing matters um, and that it's a part of uh, history, it's a part of culture. Um, and that when people see themselves, they, they feel almost like a sense of pride and that they can then in turn take that feeling and live that in their lives as well. Um, this is my little sister. Aww. Yeah, this is Asia. And on the right, this is actually today. She, went to, she goes to Northland, she went to school as an artist today um, because she said she wanted to be like me. And so that moment for me just makes me feel like I'm totally like doing, sorry, <laughs> like I'm totally on purpose. This is how I feel.